All right, so uh, uh, welcome, and thanks for coming to the talk. So I'm going to be talking about uh, this combination of machine learning and program synthesis and some of the work that uh, we've been doing over the years around this topic. At one level, the problem of machine learning and the problem of program synthesis, particularly when it comes to the problem of programming by examples, for example, or program induction, are actually very closely related. Generally, when we think about machine learning, the idea is you have a bunch of data, and from that data, you want to use your machine learning algorithm to get a learned model that, from new data, is going to tell you what, uh, what the output is supposed to be. right? And one particular flavor of synthesis looks very similar. You also have some input-output examples, and out you also get a program, but there's a couple of big differences. In particular, a really important one is that some, one of the things that we really care about when we're talking about program synthesis is the ability to have control over the structure of these programs, to be able to get something that, at the end of the day, actually looks like a program, to be able to have a lot of control over the components that are used to build this program rather than a very generic and a very general uh, uh, representation. And, uh, but at some level, you can get some generalization from these two. One of the things that we'd really like to have is essentially the best of both worlds. On the one hand, have the ability to actually deal with large amounts of data when they're available but also being able to have control over the structure and have also tight control over quantitative objectives, right? Oftentimes when we're doing uh, traditional program synthesis, one of the things that we get is the first program that satisfies the specification, that's the program that we get, and it may or may not be actually uh, the program that you want or the program that is the best for that particular task. But Beyond the interface, one of the things that you do have is a very strong uh, cultural difference between the two communities in terms of the kind of techniques that uh, we use in uh, the programming languages world and the uh, programming languages approach to program synthesis versus the kind of techniques that you see in machine learning that are primarily based on optimization or probability in some cases, as opposed to the more uh, formal deductive uh, reasoning and some of the things that are really emphasized in the PL approach to program synthesis is the ability to leverage the structure of the program and the structure of the components that you're building from the ability to do things modularly and to synthesize uh, things in a modular way, the ability to leverage abstraction so that you don't have to reason directly at the level of the lowest level of representation, but rather be able to uh, generalize and to summarize things into more abstract representations. So um, we've been thinking about this question for a while as to how do you actually bring together uh, these two flavors of reasoning. And uh, actually, now, uh, several years ago, we had a paper with uh, Suara Chaturi and I where we're looking at this question of, well, what if you actually wanted to use numerical optimization techniques in order to uh, reason over programs and in order to find, let's say, just unknown parameters over a program, right? And uh, one of the things we thought about as well one thing you could do is basically symbolically represent the effect of just propagating a Gaussian through this program. Essentially what this gives you is uh, convolution with a Gaussian gives you a smoothing um, operator over this program. Now it turns out fully propagating, symbolically propagating a Gaussian over a program gets very, very messy very, very quickly. On the one hand, uh, one of the things that you have is as soon as you go through a branch, your representation is no longer Gaussians. Your representation is now these truncated Gaussians. And in high dimensions, you basically have to represent these uh, uh, high dimensional uh, polyhedra that tell you how you are actually chopping up your Gaussian. But we had a pretty simple solution to that. We said, oh, well, we're just not going to bother. Uh, a very common thing in programming systems, if a problem becomes too hard, uh, you ignore it. Um, there's, uh, there's another really big problem, though, which is, okay, so you go through a branch, uh, 
and then these distributions change in a different way on each branch, and now you get to the joint point of the branch, and what used to be one mode in this Gaussian now turns into two modes. And the problem is if you have a branch inside a loop, for example, and the loop runs a uh, hundred times, then what used to be two modes turns into four modes and turns into eight, and very quickly it blows up and you run out of memory. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, it turns out that if you uh, basically uh, merge some of these modes and approximate these multimodal distributions with distributions with fewer modes, you can actually get something pretty sensible. One of the things that we found was that as soon as you try to do optimization on these programs, the biggest problem that you run into is not so much this continuity, but the fact that as soon as you have uh, unknown parameters controlling branches, you start seeing things that look like this, where, you know, try doing gradient descent over that. All right, even though there's a very clear uh, pattern here, the gradient is basically zero almost everywhere. And what you find is that even with all the approximations and all the shortcuts that we're playing, uh, if you smooth with uh, if you smooth with even a very narrow Gaussian, you already get uh, something that actually has a gradient in most places. And if you make your Gaussian less narrow, then you get uh, something that even if you fall under that plateau on the left, you actually get. Uh, you actually get somewhat of a gradient there. Now, if you make your Gaussian too wide, then you start getting uh, funny things. But unfortunately, what we also found was that doing this was incredibly expensive. And part of the reason why it was incredibly expensive was because these processes that I described earlier, where you actually are merging some of these uh, modes of the distribution, it turns out that in order to get actually something that looks kind of nice like this, you have to keep around a lot of modes, right? And uh, for example, here is an approximation that you get if you keep around 150 modes. Here's how it looks like if you only keep around 80 modes. And here's what it looks like if you only keep around 60. And here's what it looks like if you only keep around 10. And basically what you find is that unless you keep lots and lots of modes, you start getting garbage. Right, and this is kind of a problem, and it really comes fundamentally from the fact that these programs have these combinatorial structure, they have these branching structure, that at some level, sooner or later, it causes problems. Uh, very recently, one of the things that we've actually started playing with is what if you actually go beyond just doing a one-shot approximation of the program? And instead, you actually use a SAT solver to drive the process and to decide uh, how to direct the search and how to determine, for example, which branches should actually be uh, smoothed away and which branches you really should keep around uh, more information and which places you should really be exploring one branch and then the other. And it turns out this, uh, this can actually make a big difference and it actually allows us to tackle problems that uh, I couldn't tackle before. Here's a simple example to give you an idea of, uh, of the kind of things that you can do once you combine these two things. So uh, this is a really simple example. All we're trying to do is figure out a very simple controller to get a car to park between two other cars. All right, now, uh, one thing that makes this tricky is basically the way this problem is framed is just within these synthesis framework. You're actually writing code, and you're actually writing code that tells you, for example, that there's this world that has two obstacles that correspond to the two cars that are basically modeled just like boxes. And then you have your car, and you have a loop, a bunch of iterations, and in each iteration, the controller determines how you're going to turn the wheel, you simulate the motion of the car, you detect a collision, uh, you check some consistency properties of the car, and at the end you want to assert that you actually reach the goal. Now what makes this problem tricky, on the one hand, here's our template for the controller. It doesn't actually have that many parameters, but you see, for example, that you have some of these parameters controlling branches, which lead to these kind of uh, flat plateaus, where basically you get zero gradient over uh, this branch. But the thing that really makes this tricky, on the one hand, you have a nonlinear model, even in, with a very simplified uh, 
uh, model of the geometry, you still end up with something that has sines and cosines and square root. Uh, but also very tricky from the point of view of optimization is the fact that our criteria is that these uh, cars should not collide with the other cars. And that turns out is a uh, kind of a complicated thing. You actually have to uh, basically look at all the different corners of all the different cars and make sure that these corners are not inside each of the other car. The cool thing about this is that you write all of these in code, the way you write just code for anything else. It's just a program and the system is going through and figuring out some details about this program and coming up with a way to actually get, get it to do uh, the thing. And one of the things that we find interesting is, um, you know, the, the time to do this is, uh, you know, not great, kind of slow, but still reasonable. Uh, there have been prior approaches of combining numerical optimization techniques with uh, Boolean satisfiability, but they've been primarily geared towards verification, which it turns out is really a very different problem from the kind of synthesis problem. Because in verification, you really want to be able to prove beyond, uh, beyond any question. You want to be able to prove that there is no solution, that there is no way to fail the specification, which is a much taller order from simply saying, hey, can I find something that works? Right? And uh, it turns out for all of these benchmarks, none of them uh, can be solved uh, with existing SMT solvers. Now, it's interesting, if you don't have the SAT solver, if you just go in and say, well, let's just smooth the program and see where we can get uh, with just plain vanilla optimization. And it turns out that for a, couple, for a few of these benchmarks, uh, if you run it hundreds of times, some small percentage of them actually land in a region where they can get lucky and get to an acceptable solution, but for others, it just never happens. The optimization landscape is too messy and too complicated for, to actually get, uh, get anywhere. Um, now, this is one way of combining, uh, in this case, the ability to do logical reasoning, the ability to propagate uh, uh, Boolean constraints uh, in a way, and the ability to do combinatorial search with numerical optimization, but it's by no means the only one. Uh, for example, a different approach that we took a few years ago where what we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to do parameter synthesis, but to actually get provable guarantees about how well something was going to behave. And it turns out a very popular tool in the programming languages toolkit for doing this is abstract interpretation. But abstract interpretation has one really big problem, which is that it's hopelessly uh, discontinuous, right, in a, in a very fundamental way. So, for example, one way to think about abstract interpretation is that you are representing entire sets of values using uh, uh, just very simple geometric shapes, for example, right? In this case, we have some ellipsoids representing sets of possible values that we might pass as input to this program. And what you do is you say, okay, so this fraction of the inputs are gonna take one branch, this fraction of the inputs are going to take another branch, and then when you run, uh, of course, you always want to approximate back to the shapes that you know how to represent, in this case, ellipsoids, and then when you merge, you over approximate to say, well, I know that the set of possible values is going to be somewhere within the set. Now, why do I say that this is hopelessly discontinuous? Well, you can see here that if I change this boundary just a little bit, the outcome that I get from my analysis looks entirely different, right? Very tiny changes in uh, my program or the parameters of my program lead to radically different uh, abstractions and they can make the difference between being able to prove a property or not being able to prove a property. And so the idea we had here was, can you actually generate continuous approximations of these hopelessly discontinuous analysis that then you can use as an objective for optimization? And in an interesting experiment, one of the things we did was uh, 
we took a particular benchmark and we wanted to prove an upper bound. Uh, so in this case, it was a thermostat. Uh, we wanted to prove an upper bound of uh, uh, how, how close to, uh, or how far we can be from a target temperature, right? And so in this case, the way to interpret this graph is um, on the left, it says how many experiments we're running, and on the right is what was the bound that we got from that experiment. So this is essentially a distribution over these experiments, and higher is better. It means that a larger fraction of these, uh, of these runs uh, gave us a very good bound. And so one of the things we did was we said, compare what you get if you just try to optimize for this measure by taking a large sample of inputs versus by doing the proof-based uh, technique, the abstract interpretation-based technique. And then you empirically evaluate how good these solutions are by just throwing random points at them, right? And so what you find is that empirically, the solution that we got from sampling was a little bit better than the solution that we got through the smoothed uh, proof search, right? So, okay, so you can do a little bit better if you're just sampling than if you have these very expensive, uh, very sophisticated uh, proof-based method, right? But the difference is if you actually care about proving, not just getting something that looks like it works, but actually being able to give a formal guarantee, then the graph looks entirely different, right? The bound that you're able to prove out of the things where you just train them through sampling is really, really bad compared to the bounds that you can get out of the things where your optimization objective itself incorporated information about how this is actually going to be proved by the after interpretation based analysis. Now, these are particular examples where what you have is a very tight coupling between either the proof technique or the uh, solver-based search technique and the numerical optimization. But this is by no means the only way in which you want to combine these two things. For example, one approach that we've been playing with quite a bit recently is essentially this pipeline model. The idea is you have some kind of specification, some kind of input that is in a form that is not particularly amenable for program synthesis. And so what you want to do is you want to leverage the ability of uh, modern-day learning-based techniques to deal with uh, large inputs, to deal with unstructured inputs, and to convert that into a form that is actually amenable for uh, synthesis. All right, so one example of that is, uh, of this pipeline model, essentially the idea is you want to go from something that is very uh, rough and potentially very crude and leverage the machine learning algorithm to turn that into a structured specification that actually uh, is something that the machine learning algorithm can actually deal with. So, for example, one, uh, one of the projects where we've been doing this, this has been led by uh, Kevin Ellis, uh, in collaboration with Daniel Ritchie and Josh Sinnenbaum. Uh, so here, what we wanted to do was go from hand-drawn shapes, right, the kind of pencil and paper uh, diagram, to a program representation of that shape, right? And so the way to think about this problem is that what you have on one side is a very amorphous, unstructured uh, specification of the task that this program is supposed to accomplish. And what you want is basically use the learning-based uh, pipeline to turn that into essentially a formal specification, right? Something that actually says, look, what you're trying to do is draw a circle in this position, another circle in this position, another line in this position, another circle in this position. Basically a procedural description of how to generate that drawing. Now, if all you cared about was to generate that drawing, you could stop there. And now you have a program that can generate that drawing. But one of the things that you can do uh, with the kind of synthesis techniques that come more from the programming languages techniques is now treat that as a specification and now ask the question, okay, yes, that's a fine program, but it's not the program that I want because I want a program that actually captures some of the underlying structure between this diagram that doesn't just treat, see this as a big soup of circles and lines, but rather that identifies that there's some repeating structure to these, uh, to these things. And this includes not just loops, but 
also things like symmetries and, uh, and reflection. So what you want to do is go through this intermediate step that now puts the problem in a form that is amenable for the uh, more PL-based synthesis techniques. Now, what can you do with that? One of the interesting things you can do with that is, for example, make up for shortcomings at the level of the perception layer. For example, what we have here is uh, the first column are the drawings, and then on the second column is basically what comes out of this learning-based mechanism. And you can see that it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. For example, in the case of that first one, it basically hallucinates an arrow there, and in the case of the second one, it hallucinates a triangle there. But once you now frame this as a synthesis problem, you can actually incorporate into the synthesis problem a, uh, the ability to say, well, yeah, I could give you the program that has the arrow there, but I can give you a much shorter, much simpler program that doesn't have that arrow, right? And that actually is more faithful to the underlying pattern. The other thing that you can do is actually, uh, because now you've captured some of this underlying structure, you can actually then generalize from these uh, drawings. Now, you can see that the generalizations don't always make sense, but one of the things that is really interesting here is these generalizations come entirely from the domain-specific language that is the basis for the symbolic synthesis technique, right? In this case, for example, the domain-specific language has the ability to describe the starting point of a line in terms of coordinates, but not in terms of an attachment to another shape, right? And so what that means is that you have cases like the one below there, where it basically sees a trajectory for the starting point of those lines, rather than saying, oh, those lines are all attached to this circle. Interestingly, um, some of our colleagues at MIT from the uh, space of computer-aided design, after they uh, learned about this paper, they said, hey, this could actually be pretty useful for CAD. And uh, it turns out uh, one of the papers we recently submitted was doing something very similar in the space of essentially reverse engineering CAD models and trying to figure out from a three-dimensional mesh, a surface mesh of a machine part, to be able to actually figure out the sequence of steps that leads to generating that machine part. Again, with the goal of not just generating the machine part, but having something that captures the underlying structure that is easier to manipulate, that is easier to edit, that is not just a point cloud. There was another example of this that uh, we actually presented uh, just a couple of days ago here. This is work by Evan Poo uh, and uh, Zachary Miranda uh, in collaboration with Leslie uh, Kelbling. And in this case, it's again another instance of the pipeline model. In this case, the idea is to deal with synthesis problems where you have a very large number of input-output examples. And essentially what you want to learn is you want to learn a model that allows you to look at this very large set of input-output examples and determine a very minimal set that actually captures all the information from that larger set that is then necessary for the program synthesizer to give you a solution that you want that captures all the information of that larger set. So this turns out to actually be a quite interesting learning problem because it requires the learner to learn to uh, run through a series of examples and learn to identify which of these examples are already subsumed by examples that it has seen before. Therefore, it really requires for it to learn a representation of the information captured by those examples relative to the capabilities of the template that you're using to perform your synthesis task. And basically what we find is that compared with other kind of techniques for selecting examples, we can actually, uh, we can actually do synthesis uh, quite a bit more efficiently. Another uh, example of the synergy between learning and synthesis actually comes, uh, is, is really going back to this question of how can we tie them together more closely. And in particular, one of the problems that uh, we've been working with, uh, again, this is work led by Kevin. Uh, you're probably starting to see a pattern here. Uh, he's really good. 
So this is also work in uh, collaboration with Josh Tenenbaum. One of the questions that we had here is, for a lot of these uh, symbolic synthesis methods, one of the really crucial starting points is a domain-specific language. If you don't have the right language to actually solve the problem and to represent the problem, this can give you problems not just in terms of scalability, but also in terms of generalizability. A big aspect of generalizability comes from having the right underlying domain-specific language. And so one of the questions that we had was, well, could this be learned? And this is actually based on uh, uh, prior work by uh, Josh Tenenbaum and his group, uh, led by uh, Dector, where this was this exploration compression algorithm, where the idea was that you can start with a curriculum of problems, and from this collection of problems, basically you have a waking phase where you're trying to solve as many of these problems as you can, and then a compression phase, a sleep phase, where you're trying to now uh, look at all these problems that you solve and come up with a common representation. And basically, to make the long story short, and in the interest of time, what we find is that by combining this idea with a uh, neural network-based recognition model that allows you to hone in to those components, for all the components that you discover, you also discover how to use them and in what context to use them. You can actually uh, solve interesting problems, starting with very, very bare bones domain-specific language, and from a, basically a language that looks like 1960s Lisp, you can learn, for example, high-order functions that are useful for solving Lisp manipulation problems. You can learn things like, uh, you can learn things like map, things like uh, reduce, you can learn for uh, tasks involving text editing, you can learn primitives that figure out how to drop characters in between a range of characters, or how to do character substitution. And one of the things that you find is that this combination of the compression algorithm uh, leveraging fairly aggressive uh, combinatorial search and fairly aggressive symbolic techniques to make sure that you're able to recognize commonalities even among things that don't look like they're very, that they have a lot in common, techniques that allow you to then abstract, for example, high-order functions, combining that with a recognition model actually makes, a, uh, makes quite a bit of a difference. In particular, what these graphs are showing is the effect of the recognition model. Uh, so the, uh, non-dotted non lines are actually the percent that is solved, and the dotted lines is the solving time, and you can basically see that the solving time goes down, and it goes down, uh, it goes down more when you have this recognition model. So, I just want to conclude and say that I think there's a lot of scope for synergy between uh, machine learning and AI more broadly with programming languages techniques, and this is not just a one-way street. It's not just a matter of applying state-of-the-art machine learning techniques to help in some of these programming systems problems. But also, I think there's a lot of scope for a feedback loop in terms of leveraging some of these more symbolic techniques and leveraging some of these more symbolic approaches to actually attack interesting problems in machine learning and artificial intelligence. One of the things that I really like, for example, about this, uh, about this uh, work of learning a domain-specific language is that it's more than just a way to make synthesis more efficient. What you're doing here is really learning new abstractions, learning a language that you can use to represent knowledge in a particular domain. It's a, it gives you the ability, for example, then to transfer knowledge to other problems in the same domain, because now that knowledge is encapsulated in this very human-readable form, which is this software component, this reusable software component, this high-order functions that actually uh, you can look at, you can analyze, and you can reason formally about.